This is Chapter 5, Dimensional Analysis and Similarity, Part 8. In this video, I'm going to describe an alternate method for determining the similarity parameters. It's called the Ipsen method. It's an alternative to the method of repeating variables. And I'm going to do two examples. First, I'm going to repeat the dimensional analysis of the drag force on a rectangular plate. That's an example that we did previously using the method of repeating variables. And then I'm going to do a new example of the dimensional analysis of vortex shedding off of a structural component of a bridge. Now, neither of these examples are in your textbook, so you can see your textbook uh, if you want more practice at doing other examples. As I mentioned, the Ipsen method is an alternative approach to the method of repeating variables. I think you'll find the Ipsen method is easier to implement, but personally I find it a little less intuitive. Still, it's, it's a worthwhile alternative, uh, and it's actually quite a bit faster than the method of repeating variables. So to demonstrate this procedure, I'm going to repeat the dimensional analysis of flow over a rectangular plate to find the parameters that characterize the aerodynamic drag, FD. And if you want to see the, the analysis done by the method of repeating variables, that's in the video for Chapter 5, Part 2. So here it is again, but this time using the method of Ipsen. So we consider that we want to experimentally characterize the drag force, FD, on a rectangular plate produced by a flow of fluid perpendicular to the surface. This is the same problem, the same diagram from the previous video. Just a reminder, the drag force is a function of the flow velocity, V, a function of the fluid properties, density, and dynamic viscosity, and it depends upon the dimensions of the rectangular plate which has height h and width w. And so what we want to do now is, again, determine the dimensionless parameters needed to conduct an experiment, but this time we're going to use the method of Ipsen. You should recall the result, probably we've been over it a few times, that the drag force turns out to be a function of the aspect ratio and the Reynolds number. So we're going to do it this time, but by a new method. And I think the best way to demonstrate this method is with an example, although I'll start with a bit of a description of the technique, and then I'll proceed with this example. So you start by writing out the functional relationship with basic dimensions below each quantity. So here we go, we have the, the drag force is a function, some unknown function of the, the width, height, fluid velocity and fluid properties here, right? And we've got the dimensions. You could use the, the force length time scheme if you want. I just get used to using the mass length time scheme. It's, either one will be fine. So of course, force has units of mass length over time squared because F equals MA, right? So kilogram meter per second squared. The dimension W has dimensions of length. The height h has dimensions of length, velocity is length over time. Uh, dynamic viscosity, you can look it up at the table, or you may remember that it's mass over length time. And of course, density is mass per unit volume, so mass over length cubed. You can see this e equation has three basic dimensions, mass, length, and time. As I say, you can do it in the FL in time scheme if you want. You'll get the same result. Here's the basic procedure. What we do is we eliminate these three dimensions one at a time, and there's a very specific procedure. We start by picking one of the dimensions, and I'm going to say M. You don't have to do them in this order, but that's the order that I've gotten used to doing them in. So I pick M, and then I pick a variable on the right-hand side that contains M, and I'm going to pick Rho. And then what you do is you divide or multiply the terms in the equation that contain the dimension of m by the appropriate power of rho in order to eliminate mass uh, from uh, the equation. So if a term contained mass squared, you'd divide by that term by rho squared to eliminate m in that term. And then once you've done that, 
you remove the variable that you picked, and we picked row in this case from the list of variables on the right hand side, and then you repeat this process eliminating time and length, and then length. And the, as I say, the order doesn't matter. You could do time first, length, and then mass, whatever order you like. I'm going to do mass, time, and then length. So let's move on and demonstrate this. It sounds complicated, but I think it'll be a lot clearer once we've done a couple of examples. I think you'll actually like it better than the method of repeating variables, which takes quite a bit of time. Oh, I wanted to remind you that I've used, I'm not using an F here, F1 or F2 here, that this method uses FCN function, which stands for some unknown function. And I think the reason they don't use F1 and change it to F2 and F3 uh, is because that would get tedious. And that's just reminding you that that's some unknown function. And as we divide through by terms, actually, that function's constantly changing throughout the method. So that's the reason it's not an F or a G or something. Don't let that hang you up. It's no big deal. It's just, it's just a function. Okay, so here we go. Let's proceed. So I've written down uh, our functional relationship with the correct dimensions below each term. Uh, we pick the dimension m to start with, and I'm going to pick a, a variable on the right-hand side that has m in it as a dimension. So I could have picked dynamic viscosity, but I am going to pick rho. It's your choice. Then what you do is you divide the terms, the other terms in the equation that contain m by the necessary powers of rho in order to eliminate m. Now the two terms that have mass in them are dynamic viscosity and the drag force. You can see they have mass in them. So we're going to, and you can see it's mass to the first power. So we're going to divide dynamic viscosity and we're going to divide the drag force by rho and of course its appropriate dimensions and that will eliminate mass from our equation. So that's what we've done down here. I've divided drag force by rho, and so that means I've had to multiply uh, this by L cubed and divide by M, and so you end with L to the fourth over T squared, and there's no mass. Then we do the same thing here. We've divided the other term that contains mass, which is dynamic viscosity, by rho, and so I've got to, in order to do that, I multiply by length cubed and divide by mass, and so that's going to give me, let me check here, length squared over time. That's correct. So these dimensions are correct. And now you can see there's no mass in that equation at all. And so the way this procedure works is you then eliminate the chosen variable from the list and move on. Notice that we only divided the two terms that contained mass by rho. We didn't divide through generally by rho, and that's where I say perhaps the method is a little less intuitive. You know, maybe intuitively you would have thought you would divide all the terms by rho, but you do not. You just divide the terms that contain m, the dimension m by rho, so we only divided dynamic viscosity and the drag force. So now we eliminate rho and we move on. So what I've done now is I've rewritten our expression up here, but I've rewritten it now with the row term uh, removed from the expression because we've divided it through. So now I have the each term with the appropriate units. Now we can pick another dimension, and in this case I'm going to pick time, time and I'm going to eliminate it by picking a variable on the right hand side that contains time. Pick velocity, right, because velocity has time. So what I'm going to need to do here to eliminate, and I know I'm going to divide through by velocity, I'm going to divide those terms that contain time. Well, what terms contain time? Well, you can see there's time here and there's time here. So I'm actually going to divide this, this term by v to eliminate time, and this has time squared, so I'm going to divide this term by v squared to eliminate uh, time from, from that term. So that's what I've done down here. I've divided through by v squared, and so that means I've had to multiply by t squared upon l squared, and that's going to give you l squared over here. That's correct. 
And here I've just divided through by, I've divided the mu upon rho term by V. So that means I'm going to divide by L and multiply by T. And that's going to give me just L. That's correct. And now what we do is we eliminate that variable, the chosen variable from the list. And now we move on. So now I've rewritten the expression without V. And now you can see that the functional relationship now only contains the dimension of length. So now we repeat the process again, this time eliminating the dimension of length. And we can pick whatever variable we want on the right hand side now to eliminate length. And I'm going to pick W. Now, this dimension will be your characteristic length in the problem. So if this was flow in a pipe and you wanted your Reynolds number to be based on the diameter of the pipe, you would pick the diameter of the pipe at this point. So this is going to be the characteristic dimension in your, in your Reynolds number in, in this case. So we pick W and we divide or multiply by appropriate powers of W to eliminate L in the remaining terms. You can see the left hand side contains L squared, so we're going to have to divide by W squared, and then it becomes dimensionless. The H term just has a single L, so we divide by W and we get the aspect ratio. And the term on the far right hand side here uh, contains just a single L, so we divide by W, it becomes dimensionless, and you can see it's 1 over the Reynolds number. So now once again, we eliminate the chosen variable, and you'll see all of the remaining terms are dimensionless, and we have completed the process. So here it is, written, uh, the pi parameters written without W, and that's really the final result, except that we recognize that this is 1 over the Reynolds number, and we don't know what this functional relationship is. It has to be determined in a experiment, so you're free to invert any term you want. So we're going to recognize that second term is uh, on the right-hand side is 1 over the Reynolds number. We'll invert it, and we get that the dimensionless drag force here, so the drag force over rho v squared times an area, is just a function of the aspect ratio and of the plate and the Reynolds number. And this is exactly the same result that we got by the method of repeating variables. So the dimensionless drag force depends only upon the aspect ratio, the geometry in other words, and the Reynolds number of the flow. So now moving on to example two of the Ipsen method, I'm going to do an example that we haven't done previously. We're going to consider periodic vortex shedding off a structural component of a bridge. And I've shown it over here. So we're going to consider a, a rectangular bar, if you like, in two-dimensional flow. And we've got some vortex shedding, regular vortex shedding off, these, off of this bar. And given that the frequency of the vortex shedding is a function of the fluid velocity, the fluid property, and the dimensions of the component, the height and the width, so it's very similar to the previous example in some ways. What we want to do is use the Ipsen method to determine the dimensionless parameters that characterize the vortex shedding frequency. So we're going to use the Ipsen method, and then once we get the result, we're going to apply that result to make some predictions on a prototype structure. And so part B says here, for a prototype structure, uh, the design wind speed is 14 meters per second, that's about 50 kilometers an hour, in air at 20 degrees C and 100 kPa. And a one-fifth scale model is tested in a water tunnel. We've talked about this in a previous video. And in the water tunnel, the vortex shedding frequency is measured to be 50 hertz. And we want to, what we want to do is figure out, okay, for the water test, what is the required water speed in order to have similarity, to have similitude, and how can we relate this 50 hertz to find the vortex shedding on off of the full scale uh, structure, which I've shown over here, say a, a rectangular uh, bar in this uh, bridge. So first we'll use the Ipsen method to do the dimensional analysis. So we start 
always the same way. We write down the functional relationship. So here f doesn't mean function, it means vortex shedding, so frequency. So the problem statement gives that the vortex shedding frequency in hertz or cycles per second is f. So it has units of or dimensions of one over time. It depends on the, the width and the height, which of course have dimensions of length, velocity of the flow, length over time, dynamic viscosity, which has units of mass over length time, and density of the flow, mass over length cubed. So using Ibsen's method, you pick, uh, we, I'm going to start with M, so I'm going to eliminate M. You don't have to start with M, but that's just my choice. So we, I'm going to start by eliminating M, and I'm going to pick the variable rho, as we did last time, and I'm going to divide or multiply by appropriate powers of rho to eliminate m in the remaining terms of the function. So you can see that dynamic viscosity is the only term that contains m, so I'm going to divide dynamic viscosity by uh, rho and that will eliminate m. And so I'm going to multiply by l cubed and divide through by, by m, and so that's going to lead me with l squared upon t, so that's correct. And then of course as the method goes, we then eliminate rho from the list. So now I've rewritten that expression again, the same expression, this time now uh, without rho on the right-hand side. So going methodically, you're going to pick a right-hand side variable now that contains time. I'm just selecting time uh, arbitrarily, and I'm going to pick velocity. So now I'm going to divide through by appropriate powers, or multiply by appropriate powers of v, in order to eliminate time from the remaining variables. And time appears here, and time appears here. Uh, just uh, one time to the minus one. So I'm going to divide by velocity, I'm going to divide frequency by velocity, I'm going to divide mu over rho by velocity, and that'll eliminate time. And that's what I've done over here. So that's going to mean multiply by time, divide by length, so that becomes 1 over L, that's correct. And I'm going to multiply this by time and divide by length, and this is going to become just L, that's correct. And we don't do anything with the other terms. These other terms don't contain time, you leave them alone. So now we eliminate velocity from the list, and we move on rewriting the previous expression, now without velocity in the list, you can see that we only have the dimensions of, of length. And so now we pick a right-hand side variable that contains length, and I'm going to choose w again. Again, that becomes your characteristic dimension in your what's going to become your Reynolds number. And so, and I divide by appropriate powers, or multiply. So you can see, in order to eliminate uh, length in the frequency term, I'm going to have to multiply frequency by w, and these other ones I'm going to have to divide by w. And that's what I've done, right? So I've multiplied the frequency term by w, and the other two terms I've divided by w, and now they all become dimensionless. And you can eliminate w from the list. So by now, hopefully, you're starting to see how, how easy this method is. It's actually quite a lot easier than the method of repeating variables. So now we're done. I've rewritten the expression without w, and we get the expression shown here. We have fw upon v, so the frequency, the width of the bar over the free stream velocity. This is a dimensionless number called the Struhall number, which I've mentioned in previous videos. And it's a function of just the aspect ratio of the bar and the free stream Reynolds number based on the uh, width of the structural element. So the Struhall number is a dimensionless frequency, and that dimensionless frequency is only a function of the geometry and the Reynolds number. And again, we can recognize this as one, 1 over the Reynolds number, so I've rewritten it down here as just Reynolds number. So now moving on to part two, I realize it's been a little while since we talked about the part 
the second part of the question. Uh, we're actually going to do a numerical example where we determine the vortex shedding off of the prototype. So for the prototype structure, this structural member on the bridge, the design wind speed is 14 meters per second, which is about 50 kilometers an hour. And of course the bridge exists in air at 20 degrees C and 100 kPa, at least as our design conditions. To test the vortex shedding, a one-fifth scale model will be tested in a water tunnel at 20 degrees C. And in the water tunnel, the vortex shedding off the model is measured to be 50 hertz, so 50 cycles per second. And we want to calculate what the required water speed has to be for the model in order to have similitude or similar conditions. That's going to require the same Reynolds number. And we want to relate this 50 hertz that we measured in the water tunnel to the vortex shedding off the bridge to avoid uh, resonance effects. So we want to find the vortex shedding on the prototype bridge at 14 meters per second. So the solution proceeds as follows. The model is a one-fifth scale, so we know that the width of the prototype over the width of the model and the height of the prototype over the height of the model is 1 over 5. And as I mentioned, of course, for similitude, we want to have the same Reynolds number. So I can set the Reynolds number of the model equal to the Reynolds number of the prototype. And then what I've done is I've solved for the velocity of the water for the model. So that's the water velocity. And you just end up with a ratio of properties, the scale, and this is the design speed for the prototype, which we're told is 14 meters per second up here. The wind is blowing it on the bridge at 14 meters per second. So here I've rewritten the expression for the velocity of the water over the model in terms of our property ratios and the, the length scale and the velocity of the air. And now we can start to evaluate the properties. So for the prototype, the prototype operates in air at design conditions of 20 degrees C and 100 kPa. So I've calculated the density of air using the ideal gas law. We've done that many times. I could have just looked it up in a table as well. I've looked up the dynamic viscosity of air at 20 degrees C. That's table A2 in your textbook. For the model, you look up the properties of water at 20 degrees C in table A1. There's the density of water and the dynamic viscosity of water. Making the substitutions now back up into this expression at the top, uh, we can get the velocity of the water over the model. And so remember the variables without the subscript are the prototype. Those are the air properties. The variables with the subscript M are the model, which is in a water tunnel. So they're the properties of water. And so you can see you've got the density of air over the density of water, viscosity of water over viscosity of air. The length scale here is 5 to 1, so the prototype is 5 times longer or wider than the model, so 5 to 1, and we're told that the design wind speed for the prototype is 14 meters per second. And when you multiply that out, you get that the speed of the water in the water tunnel for this test, in order to have the same Reynolds number, should be 4.65 meters per second. And you'll notice that that velocity is lower than the velocity of the wind. And that's because, as we discussed in a previous video, water has a lower kinematic viscosity than air. So you don't require as high a velocity to get the same Reynolds number. As a side note, and we, we did mention this before, that if the model was tested in a wind tunnel with a scale of 5 to 1, you'd need to run the wind tunnel to get the same Reynolds number at 5 times 14 meters per second, and you get some ridiculously high velocity, which would be quite difficult to achieve. So you can see why uh, using a water tunnel it has its advantages. So in part A of this problem, we showed that the dimensionless vortex shedding frequency here in terms of the Struhall number is just a function of the aspect ratio and 1 over the Reynolds number here. And so our prediction equation becomes this term uh, pi 1. So we can set 
the Struhall number for the model equal to the Struhall number, this dimensionless frequency for the prototype. And what I've done is I've solved for the vortex shedding frequency off the prototype in air. And so we get this expression down here. Let me just look at it, make sure it's the right way around. V over Vm, Wm, yep, so that's correct. So the velocity, remember the variables without the subscript are air, and the variables with the subscript are the model, which is water. The design wind speed is 14 meters per second. We showed that the water speed for the same Reynolds number was 4.65 meters per second to get the same Reynolds number. The length scale here is the model over the prototype, so that's 1 over 5, that's correct. And it was measured in the water tunnel that the vortices were shed at 50 hertz, but in air they will be shed at 30.1 hertz. So that's the, the answer we're looking for. And of course this unsteady vortex shedding produces weak but very periodic uh, forces on the structure and even weak forces if they're applied near the resonant frequency you know from your vibrations course that they can produce a large amplitude of induced uh, flow induced vibration so this forcing frequency would be compared to natural frequencies from vibration analysis to avoid possible resonance it's interesting to note that we didn't actually need the height and the width of this component to do this analysis. All we needed to know was that the uh, model was a one-fifth scale. And actually that completes uh, chapter five. So now you should have a very good understanding of dimensional analysis and how it is used in model studies. And in fact, here we are. This is the last video in the course. I have hoped you enjoyed these videos. Uh, it was certainly a pleasure putting them together. Uh, when you get time, please feel free to send me any helpful comments or constructive suggestions that might improve these videos. You probably noticed they got better as I went on, got more skill uh, with the software. And I hope you're not watching this uh, final video the night before the final exam, but in any case, good luck on the final exam.